Uh, I'm John Torcheri, the, the co-director of the International Policy Center, and uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, the director of the International Institute, Pauline jones Luong. Uh, we thank uh, the International Institute uh, for bringing together this event, and also the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies, which with the International Policy Center is co-sponsoring. So I'll turn it over to Pauline, who will introduce our panel. Thanks, John. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, and welcome to the International Institute's uh, Roundtable on uh, ISIS, Understanding ISIS, Evolution, Ideology, and Implications. This event, of course, would not be possible without the co-sponsorship of the International Policy Center, so thank you very much, John. Um, and thank you to all the staff that also made this possible. Thank you to the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies for their co-sponsorship. Thank you to Thea Rowe, uh, the Program Administrator at IPC. Um, thank you to Margaret Lakin, our Communications Director for the International Institute. And thank you to Beth uh, for also uh, the Program Specialist at Semenis for uh, helping us put this all together and do it in a very short period of time. One of the things we're trying to do with these International Institute Roundtables is to take a sort of ongoing international practice or event and very quickly put together a panel of experts, mostly from our own faculty and experts that are on the University of Michigan campus or within the state of Michigan. As you notice, one of our panelists is from Michigan State University, and we're very, very grateful to have him here. Um, ISIS has gained increasing media attention and alarmed leader, leaders around the world since June 2014, when it seized uh, control of large swaths of territory in northeastern Syria and western Iraq and declared the establishment of an Islamic State. But this Islamist extremist group, also known as ISIL, or the Islamic State, has been growing in strength and popularity for several years, and some would argue the roots of its grievances are centuries old. This International Institute Roundtable brings together four experts to shed light on different aspects of ISIS, its ideology, its origins, its popular support, and the impact it has or is having on the international system. Our four panelists I will introduce in the order in which they are going to speak today. First, Professor Juan Cole, who is the director of the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies and a professor of history here at the University of Michigan. Second, Professor Mark Tesler, professor of political science and formerly the vice provost for international affairs at the University of Michigan. Professor Muhammad Khalil, professor of religious studies at Michigan State University and the director of the Muslim Studies Program. And finally, James Morrow, Professor of Political Science here at the University of Michigan. Before we begin, I want to ask you to please hold your questions until the end. Uh, and please to feel free to write them down in note cards that will be passed around the audience. You can address your questions to specific members of the panel or to the panel as a whole. I will read the questions from this podium and then ask uh, the panelists to respond to those questions. We hope this will expedite the questions and allow for as much discussion and participation from the audience as possible. So without further ado, I will hand it over to uh, Professor Wong Cole. Uh, thank you, uh, Pauline. Thanks to the International Institute and the Ford School for uh, having this event. Um, I am uh, going to start off by uh, talking about Sunni grievances, and, uh, and I call it ISIL, ISIS, uh, arose by any other name. Um, and uh, what I'd like to suggest is that the collapse of the state uh, that we've seen in Syria and Iraq uh, is primarily an economic phenomenon and the conflicts that we are seeing in the region are primarily economic in nature. Uh, they have to do uh, with uh, uh, this, the transition from, broadly speaking, socialist states, uh, ones on somewhat the Soviet model, very large public sectors. Uh, in Iraq, there wasn't so much private industry until the 80s. Uh, and, um, uh, as, as these countries have moved from, uh, you know, when you move from a socialist state to a neoliberal capitalist one, apparently you can do it right or do it wrong. So Argentina did it wrong, collapsed. Turkey, not so bad. Uh, Russia seems to be having trouble 
so Syria and Iraq are situations where there must be some intervening variable between these political ideologies that accounts for why it can be done successfully or unsuccessfully. But in any case, um, I'm, I, I can't tell you what those are. Uh, I do know that um, as they moved from socialist states to, to neoliberal ones, they did it with corruption and insider trading because in, in systems where the state controls the economy, if you privatize, then state actors are the ones that are privatizing and they know where the good deals are. And if they're <coughs> unconstrained in pursuing those deals, then they call up their cronies and say, you know, have I got a steel mill for you? It's going on the block. You can have it for a sum. Uh, and um, in Syria and Iraq, this, this transition was exacerbated also by uh, the ways in which the societies uh, uh, are composed of, of religious and ethnic groups. And I think those religious and ethnic divisions now have come to the fore in a big way, but they're not essential. You go back to the 1950s and read the newspapers in Syria and Iraq, nobody's talking about Sunnis and Shiites. They're worried a lot about communists. And there's something called the Ba'ath Party, which is you know, Arab nationalist and, and socialist and anti-imperialist. But even in the US diplomatic documents, if you read them for those era, the real question is, are these, is it going to be a China situation or the president's going to go uh, uh, communist? Uh, but because of the transition to neoliberalism and the way that it was done in a very corrupt way, the creation of crony capitalists uh, associated with the regime, it starts to matter which ethnic group the cronies are from because somebody's getting a lot of the goodies here and somebody's ox is being gored and they're being denied services and, and, uh, and access to the state. And then people start to mobilize their, their political, their, their ethnic identities and religious identities. So in Syria, the, the revolt against the Ba'ath regime began um, uh, really uh, with uh, 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 farmers protesting not having en enough water. The state wasn't arranging the irrigation properly as it used to. And, and there was a long-term drought in these regions which has fed into the state collapse uh, and which may well uh, be uh, a result of climate change. It's not that we ever had droughts before in the Middle East, but this is a very severe and long-lasting one. And the region is very arid and could be changing. Uh, so the farmers, you know, can't make it. And then they go to the cities to look for jobs as day laborers and construction workers. And then the 2008-2009 collapse came along globally, and there just wasn't much construction work to be had. So if you look in Syria, the original protests down in Deha were, were, were water protests by farmers and in the depot town where the farmers' markets were. And then around this uh, sort of Homs and Hama, the center of Syria, it, it was in the slums where the, the workers didn't have jobs and they had come to find a livelihood having, having failed as, as farmers because of the water crisis. Uh, so the, the crisis, crisis of global capitalism and the crisis of, of climate uh, both intersected there in Syria. And the similar things happened in Iraq. And of course, Iraq was complicated also by the US uh, invasion of 2003, which is the damn foolest thing this country's ever done. Uh, and um, in which uh, the Bush administration uh, overthrew the Ba'ath government, which was, as I said, a socialist government. And, and despite some Sunni Shiite tensions of some severity in the 90s, there were a lot of Shiite Ba'athists, and so the party had some buy-in across the country. But when the Americans came in, and sometimes they were pushed into it rather than plotting at it, essentially they brought a Shiite elite to power. Uh, and uh, that Shiite elite wasn't just any old Shiite elite. It was the religious Shiite parties, the ones that were dedicated to making a Shiite religious state, some of them on the Iran model. And these were uh, the people that Paul Bremer, the American <coughs> vice in Iraq, appointed to the interim governing council, uh, people who, whose parties had been formed by Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran in, in the old days when they were in exile in Iraq. Uh, 
And, and when the Shiites came to power in a big way, they, they excluded the Sunnis. And, and, they, and their political ideologies were, were antithetical to the Sunnis. Uh, the Sunnis of Iraq were mostly fairly secular minded. And, and this thing of an alliance of convenience with a, a radical fundamentalist group like ISIL is not representative of, of where the Sunni Arab community has been in Iraq in the past half century. They've been mostly, uh, you know, would, would have been reading more Lenin and less, uh, a less say, uh, 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 the Egyptian fundamentalist. Uh, and um, however, uh, they were put in a situation where they rejected the Shiite and American written constitution. Uh, they, uh, uh, two, uh, uh, all three Sunni majority provinces rejected that constitution in 2005. Uh, they're a minority and a unicameral parliament, which means they're going to lose every vote from here to eternity to a coalition of Shiites and Kurds. So they're a permanent electoral minority. They're pushed to the margins. And then when the Arab Spring came along uh, in, in 2011 and after, there was a Sunni Arab Spring. So youth in Fallujah and Mosul came out in the city squares and protested. Uh, and, um, uh, and they, um, they wanted uh, political openness of a sort that the hardline Shiite Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki was not offering them. And, uh, and the, the, the Iraqi government, which as I said was in the hands of Shiite fundamentalists, deployed helicopter gunships against these peaceful protesters uh, and um, crushed the protest movement in the past three years in the Sunni Arab areas. Well, if the message is, you, you're, you've been made unemployed because the Americans and the Shiites together abolished the state factories and other state enterprises that had provided employment in places like Mosul. And unlike what you may have been taught in Economics 101 in America, there is no magic hand that will create an entrepreneur class out of nothing in a place like Iraq if you overthrow the government. So there was just widespread unemployment once they got rid of those state enterprises, in the Sunni Arab areas in particular. And they often even brought their Shiite friends and relatives to fill the jobs of the, uh, that, that the Sunnis had been fired from. Uh, and, and Paul Bremer has admitted that it was one of the great mistakes that he made to go along with this Shiite plan to fire the Sunnis from their jobs on the grounds that the Sunnis had been uh, Baathists, so it was something called debothification, and they likened them to Nazis. But they weren't Nazis, and anyway, the Nazis went on in, in Germany in the 1950s in their same jobs. The Nazi high school teachers, almost none of them were fired, and in fact, if you look at the high political elite of Germany in the 1950s, full of former Nazis, so the, the, the Shiite Iraqi line that they were just doing what was done in occupation Germany is not true. And it was very un, uh, unwise what they did. And they just pushed the Sunnis to the margins. These were the, the capable people in Iraq. They were the, you know, the equivalent of West Point graduates and Harvard Law and, and uh, high politicians and the people who manage things. And they were all told, you're now unemployed. If, if, you, if you behave yourself, you might be able to get a job as a shoe shiner uh, to the Shiites. And uh, so they went into rebellion. And, and they, they were Baathist cells that went into rebellion. Uh, secular ones, uh, the leftist ones, and there are tribal ones, there are neighborhoods, and, and there are fundamentalist ones, some of them hooked up at some points with Al-Qaeda. Uh, and what happened really in June of this year was that having tried everything, having been locked out of politics, having been <coughs> marginalized, having been not given services, uh, and, and so forth, the, the, the remnants of the Baathist elite the secular Arab nationalist, socialist uh, elite, and, uh, uh, and some Sufi orders, uh, these are mystical orders in, in, in Sunni Islam, uh, in Mosul, made a deal with the devil. ISIL came to them and said, we can rescue you from the Shiites. We'll throw them off. And Mosul and other cities conducted an urban uprising against the Iraqi army. It wasn't that 5,000 ISIL fighters came down and conquered Mosul. They hooked up with Mosul. It was more like a, a blind date. 
Uh, and, uh, and, and what happened really was more like Tahrir Square in Cairo, where, where the Mubarak government was overthrown by people in the street. The soldiers who ran away were told that it was, it talked about you know, masses coming at them, throwing stones at them. Well, if you've got a city of two million people rising up against 70,000 soldiers, it's not clear who takes that one. Uh, and and they were, the, these soldiers were mostly Shiites from the south, and they were darned if they were going to die up way up north in, in Mosul for for uh, for the al-Maliki corrupt government, and especially since their officers ran away. So uh, this 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 conflict, which as I said seems to me mainly to have been regional and economic, has now been re reworked into fundamentalist far right Shiites versus fundamentalist far right Sunnis, and in that form. The problem is insoluble because what's now happened is that the Obama administration has allied with the Shiites and the Kurds to conquer the, back the Sunni Arab areas of Iraq. And the optics of that are not going to look good. I mean, that's like, you know, allying with the Irish government to conquer England. It's, it, it's, it's going to, it would look like Catholics conquering Protestants, right? So um, uh, I, I, I predict dark days ahead. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so <coughs> what I have to present is uh, some public opinion data. <coughs> I've been part of a couple of international teams that have been doing surveys uh, in the Middle East, and Iraq is one of the countries in which the surveys have been done. Uh, so I have some data from uh, a couple of early surveys from 2004 and 2006, and a couple of later surveys from 2011 and 2013. Uh, I'm just going to kind of give you a feel for, for them. Uh, these are kind of descriptive, just quick pictures. I'm not going into a lot of detail, uh, but I think they, uh, they're actually pretty consistent with the, the, the framework that Juan laid out. And uh, I'm happy to talk about methodology if, we're, if there's interest in it. It's probably not really necessary. You can read up here the, uh, the main points. Uh, these are nationally representative <coughs> samples. They were done by uh, a very qualified firm. And as I say, I'll be happy to talk more about them. So uh, for one of the first slides, uh, this has to do with sectarianism. And we, uh, this is part of an interview schedule that has actually quite a large number of questions about sectarian identity. Uh, this is just one of them. It's, it's one that's a good predictor of some of the other questions. And the question is simply, uh, are you more concerned about taking care of and defending your own sectarian community? Uh, or uh, are you thinking of yourself primarily as, uh, as an Iraqi and your goal is to, for to participate in forging an Iraqi national identity? What stands out in this picture is that for all of the groups, uh, less for the Kurds, the Kurds are somewhat divided, and if you know something about Iraq, that's not surprising. Uh, but there isn't, uh, kind of consistent with what, what Juan Cole was saying, there is not a lot of support for uh, my community first. Uh, there isn't, we don't see a lot of expressions of sectarianism. That comes through in some of the other items in, in the survey as well. Uh, and secondarily, while that's true in general, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's even increased, the intensity of that is increased if we compare 2004 and 2006. Uh, the distributions are skewed even more toward the national identity and away from the my community <coughs> uh, dimension. And although the Kurds remain somewhat divided, even they are skewed to some extent in, in, in that direction now. Uh, it'd be interesting, there are some analyses that we've done to kind of figure out what are some of the determinants of that, what predicts if someone is going to be more toward one pole or to the other pole. Uh, a question that's interesting is to what extent it might be, among other things, uh, a product of, re of, uh, of a kind of resistance to the American occupation, which was broadly unpopular. Uh, but it also has to do with something that Juan Cole was saying, uh, that sectarian identities were not at the forefront of thinking of large numbers of people, and the data seemed to support that. Uh, second, we asked them, although this is not really terribly pertinent for today's discussion, we asked them about how they thought about the American forces there. Uh, and as you can see, uh, again, there is uh, strong skewing in terms of opposition, even among, uh, even among Shia. And that number gets uh, even more pronounced uh, if we look at 2006 as opposed to 2004. Uh, there is not a very favorable impression of uh, what the US is doing there. Uh, Kurds are, that's less true of the Kurds, although they move in the direction of opposition as well, even though they remain divided. Uh, but this to give you a little, a little bit of a feel for uh, what the populations were thinking uh, during the early years of the American invasion and occupation, and particularly the absence of uh, strong sectarian sentiments. 
<coughs> so switching, moving to the present, uh, I'm just going through this pretty quickly. Uh, moving to the, not to the present, but to 2011 and 2013, two surveys that were done, and you have the, you have the dates up there. <coughs> uh, we asked a couple of different questions. One question was about how you feel about uh, the government. Uh, and the question is, you can read, how would you evaluate the performance of, 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 of the government in carrying out its basic duties and responsibilities? And the second question, which is in the next slide, and that's the last slide, has to do with political Islam, and, and, and you'll see some patterns. Um, the, uh, the pattern here is that uh, the Sunni are skewed toward, uh, very clearly toward a negative view of the government. It's really not very surprising if we know something about Iraq, and really it's consistent with what Juan Cole was saying. Uh, it's surprising that goes down a little bit in, from two, in 2013 from 2011. I'm not sure if that's just a certain amount of sampling variation or uh, if there was some slight decline. But even so, the Sunnis are very much skewed uh, toward the poll of, of, of uh, unfavorable attitudes toward the government. Uh, the Shia are uh, skewed in the uh, opposite direction. And uh, that increases between 2011 and 2013. Uh, as we would probably expect, knowing what, thing, what was going on in the country and the ascendance of a, of a Sunni-dominated, of a Shia-dominated regime, uh, that uh, see, although there is more division than one might have expected, uh, they're not overwhelmingly of the opinion that the government is doing a good or a very good job. But certainly, compared to the other uh, sectarian communities, they're very much in, in that direction. Uh, and the Kurds uh, are somewhat divided and remain somewhat divided but they move toward a more negative position uh, over, uh, over the course of the two-year period between 2011 and 2013. Finally, the last slide, and then I'll, I'll just try to summarize some of the takeaways from this. Uh, the last slide asks people what they think about uh, the role of Islam in political life. Uh, in this battery, this is part of something called the Arab Barometer. That's, we, did, we did this battery in 12 different Arab countries. Uh, there are actually quite a large number of questions about Islam's political role and the role of the Sharia and, and a whole series of questions. I picked out one question that's pretty representative of what we find on most of the other questions. There is a little bit of variation from, from question to question. And here we see, uh, again, clear sectarian differences. Uh, with, uh, in 2011, in the earliest of the surveys we have, uh, it's the Sunni that overwhelmingly say uh, religious leaders should not influence public uh, government decisions that express a more separate government and religion and politics kind of point of view, uh, a more secular point of view. And the other two communities are essentially uh, divided. I might say also that that division, uh, the, Shi uh, the, the, Sunni, the Sunnis of Iraq are the outlier here in terms of what we're finding in the Arab barometer. In general, there is uh, pretty much of a division of opinion about whether Islam should or should not play an important role in political life. And that division is, is reflected in the other communities. Uh, it's very much what we found in most of the other countries with some uh, cross-country variation. But uh, the, the Sunnis stand out as, uh, as much more secular in their orientation. If we shift to 2013, uh, kind of referencing the alliance uh, of convenience, I guess that's what we call it, that Juan Cole was talking about, we see that it is the Sunni who are more supportive of, although still divided, uh, more, more supportive of Islam playing a political role, want Islam to be part of the government process. That's the political formula they, they endorse more frequently than the other groups. And both of the other two communities uh, have shifted more toward a more secular perspe perspective. Mm -hmm. So what emerges from this is that uh, sectarianism is not very pronounced in the early years. The various questions we asked to try to get a sense of how important it is to be a Shia as opposed to or a Sunni as opposed to an Iraqi suggest that there is not a lot of sectarian, uh, sectarianism. Uh, clear differences between the communities emerge during the later period. Uh, the predispositions either with respect to evaluation of the government or with respect to the role that Islam should play in political affairs, differentiate the communities with the Sunnis on one end, uh, the Shia on another, and the Kurds kind of in the middle. So if we want to talk more about some of these findings in the q and I'll be happy to do so, but this is to give you a sense for how things look from the ground. Thanks. OK, well, good afternoon. Um, it's always nice to be back at my alma mater and I'd like to thank Professor Pauline Long for organizing this panel 
Now, as uh, someone who studies Islamic thought, I'm interested to know how radical Muslim groups attempt to justify the killing of civilians. And in the brief time that I have, we will examine the discourse of two radical groups, Al-Qaeda, or Al-Qaeda, and ISIS, or the Islamic State, ISIL, Daesh, etc. Now, at the outset, I should stress that although the Iraq branch of Al-Qaeda Al was the precursor to ISIS, ISIS and Al-Qaeda Central are two distinct organizations. Al-Qaeda has essentially disowned ISIS, and ISIS has attempted to establish a state apparatus. But the differences run deeper. Consider, for instance, ISIS's publicized execution of James Foley and others. ISIS seems to be using publicized executions as a vehicle for enticing potential recruits. As for Al-Qaeda, although its terrorist attacks were certainly intended to attract attention, the organization has generally avoided publicizing executions. But whereas Al-Qaeda has tended to publicize its discourse by releasing various recordings of its leaders and publishing and posting numerous statements, ISIS thus far has given us relatively little material to work with. That makes analyzing their logic relatively difficult. Nevertheless, despite the profound differences between Al-Qaeda and ISIS, we have good reason to assume that both follow ostensibly similar lines of thinking when it comes to their legal justifications for the killing of civilians. So what I'd like to do now is look at how Osama bin Laden attempted to justify the 9-11 attacks within an Islamic legal framework and then draw comparisons to the only widely broadcast speech by the current leader of ISIS who goes by the alias Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. First, bin Laden. <clears throat> In 1998, bin Laden and four other individuals issued a joint fatwa, a, or legal opinion, calling on Muslims to fight and kill Americans. Bin Laden and company present this call to arms as a defensive jihad, a defensive struggle against an oppressive force. Bin Laden's three specific grievances are one, the US military occupation of Saudi Arabia, two, US support for Israel, and three, the US imposed sanctions on Iraq that allowed for the death of numerous innocent children. Three years and a few Al-Qaeda attacks terrorist attacks later, 9-11 occurred. Approximately 40 days after the attacks, Al Jazeera interviewed bin Laden. Here is a portion of that exchange. <coughs> Defending the legitimacy of the 9-11 attacks, Usama bin Laden says, the killing of innocent civilians, as America and some intellectuals claim, is really very strange talk who said that our children and civilians are not innocent and that shedding their blood is justified, that it is lesser in degree. When we kill their innocence, the entire world from east to west screams at us and America rallies its allies, agents, and the sons of its agents who said that our blood is not blood, but theirs is. The reporter then asks, so what you are saying is that this is a type of reciprocal treatment. They kill our innocence, so we kill their innocence. Bin Laden, so we kill their innocence, and I say it is permissible in law and intellectually, because those who spoke on this matter spoke from a juridical perspective. Here he's referring to Muslim jurists, Muslim scholars of Islamic law, who condemned the 9-11 attacks. The reporter asks, what is their position? Bin Laden, that it is not permissible. They spoke of evidence that the messenger of God forbade the killing of women and children. This is true. Reporter, this is exactly what I'm asking about. Bin Laden, however, this prohibition of the killing of children and innocents is not absolute. It is not absolute. He goes on to say, the men that God helped on 9-11 did not intend to kill babies. They intended to destroy the strongest military power in the world to attack the Pentagon, which the house has more than 64,000 employees, a military center that houses the strength and the military intelligence. Reporter, how about the Twin Towers? Bin Laden, 
The towers are an economic power and not a children's school. Those that were there are men that supported the biggest economic power in the world. They have to review their books. We will do as they do. If they kill our women and our innocent people, we will kill their women and their innocent people until they stop. So, to recap, Bin Laden's somewhat contradictory claims are as follows. One, innocent civilians were not targeted on 9-11. Who was targeted? Men, he doesn't mention women, men that supported the biggest economic power in the world. Two, protection of civilians is not absolute. Their deaths are collateral damage. And then three, he goes on to say, it's retaliation. They kill our innocents, so we kill their innocents. <clears throat> Just a little over two weeks later, in an interview with Pakistani journalist Hamid Mir, bin Laden asserts that American civilians forfeit their protected or non-combatant status because they pay taxes and elect their, their president and the Congress. Elsewhere, bin Laden maintains that his method of fighting the United States is a matter of necessity or darura. In other words, he's saying it is necessary to kill American civilians because that is, there is no other way for Muslims to defend themselves against such a powerful foe. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Now, contrary to popular belief, numerous Muslim jurists and leaders from California to Cairo to Qum to Kuala Lumpur condemned the 9-11 attacks in September of 2001. These include some of the most outspoken critics of the United States, such as the ever controversial jurist Yusuf al-Qaradawi. In fact, if you study Georgetown University's 2009 list of the uh, 500 most influential Muslims in the world, and it's an imperfect list, they, I think they included an Arab Christian on the list, and they, they ranked the top 50, I think, and had the King of Morocco at number three, no offense to Morocco. Um, but if you study the list and you look at these influential Muslims, you would see that the vast majority rejected the 9-11 attacks. And according to a major 2008 Gallup poll, the same is true for Muslims in general. Bin Laden had argued that the 9-11 attacks were retaliatory. According to most Muslim jurists, however, there are limits to retaliation. Bin Laden had asserted that the innocents killed on 9-11 were collateral casualties. According to numerous jurists, however, the collateral casualties justification fails when combatants are not directly targeted. Bin Laden had argued that American civilians who aid and abet the U.S. government forfeit their protected or non-combatant status. According to numerous jurists, however, it takes more than voting and paying taxes for individuals to be deemed legitimate targets. Finally, bin Laden had argued that his method of fighting the United States can be justified through the Islamic legal principle of necessity or darura. According to numerous jurists, however, necessity cannot be invoked to justify heinous acts. And now we turn our attention to ISIS. And of course, everything I have to say about ISIS is tentative because what I say today might not hold true tomorrow. My focus here will be Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's only widely broadcast speech, a sermon given in Mosul last July. Unlike bin Laden, al-Baghdadi declares himself to be a caliph or uh, uh, the head of a, a new Islamic state. But like bin Laden, al-Baghdadi presents his call to arms as a defensive jihad and one directed against much of the world. He says, Raise your ambitions, O soldiers of the Islamic State, for your brothers all over the world are waiting for your rescue and are anticipating your brigades. It is enough for you to just look at the scenes that have reached you from Central Africa and from Burma before that. What is hidden from us is far worse, so by Allah we will take revenge. By Allah we will take revenge. The message here is that it is us versus the world. Pseudo-Muslims and non-Muslims here and elsewhere are out to get us, so we have to be aggressive in order to defend ourselves. Al-Baghdadi goes on to rebuke critics who describe ISIS as a terrorist organization. If ISIS acts qualify as terrorism, he asserts, then terrorism is to refuse humiliation, subjugation, and subordination. It is to insist upon your rights and not give them up. Then, in an attempt to rebuke the United States and others using sarcasm, he states, but terrorism does not include the killing of Muslims. 
All this is not terrorism, rather it is freedom, democracy, peace, security, and tolerance. Implicit here are some of the same justifications for killing that appear in Bin Laden's discourse. And of course we see an explicit call for retaliation. As with 9-11, we find numerous Muslim jurists rejecting ISIS's method of fighting, even if they share many of their grievances. An obvious example of this rejection would be the open letter to al-Baghdadi, which was signed by over 120 prominent Muslim jurists and leaders. Although it, appears, it, although it appears that the vast majority of Muslims reject ISIS, it is an organization that continues to attract new members who find the call for revenge compelling, especially in the fragile Iraqi and Syrian contexts, where you have many Sunnis who view various non-Sunni and even other Sunni factions with suspicion and contempt. Therefore, as it stands now, the most that Sunni jurists can hope to do is limit, not terminate, but limit the ideological influence of ISIS. Uh, to be sure, the fight against ISIS will require more than Muslim jurists simply condemning them. As Professor Cole has indicated, there are, of course, many issues beyond the purview of Islamic law that must be addressed and redressed. Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk about this in a rather different perspective, to look at it from the point of view of U.S. foreign policy and U.S. grand strategy, and to what extent the concern about concerns about ISIS and the actions the U.S. is currently taking in uh, Iraq and Syria fit into that. So, where I want to start with first is a little bit of talk about um, general principles here. Being a political scientist, I like to talk about those things. Um, and here's an observation that the international system is both shaped by the domestic institutions of states and shapes them in turn. So we have an interdependence of the two. And in specific, the principles and the norms that exist in the international system are in part created and enforced over time because they help national leaders address the issues that help them to maintain power domestically. I'll give you a few examples of this in a little bit. At the same time, domestic politics matters because it helps to create the incentives that leaders face in international politics. That is, they take actions in international politics in part to advance the interests of their people within their country whose interests they purport to advance. And so the two of them are then interdependent, that they're not easily separable. And in particular, the basis of the legitimacy of the state, why the state exists, what, whose interests it serves, what it does, influences what norms and principles can be created and sustained in international politics. That is, the character of international politics overall. So here are the questions about why does the state exist and what is its purpose. Um, that helps to shape the aims of the state because that understands what citizens expect from their state and how their leaders then will try and meet those expectations in ways that will allow them to do this. It also influences things because it affects the ability of the state to extract resources from the population that in turn give it power internationally. Or to put it another way, international norms then, in some sense, advance the purpose of the state. And this is one reason why they're contested in, in world politics generally, is that they have real consequences both internationally and domestically. Okay, so where I want to start with to think about, about U.S. global strategy then is to talk about competing models of state legitimacy in the world today. The first of those is the one that in some sense has created many of the principles that undergird the world, which is the Western model. This is a belief in liberal democracy as the way to organize politics with free markets. Now, there's a lot of variation across Western states in how these principles get worked out, but it's an idea that there's a marriage of, um, of both free politics and free economics. This has consequences for what the international order looks like. It, it advocates for an open economic international order for example, because, it, because you can then get the gains of international exchange through trade and finance and other ways that help advance economic interests in those free economies. A second model is what we, what, I don't have a great word for it, but I call it high-performing autocracies. These are authoritarian governments, so they reject the idea of liberal democracy, um, but that engage in the market economy internationally. Yeah, if you want the two primary examples of this in current world politics, they would be China and Singapore. That is, that they don't accept 
the international principles that go with liberal democracy, such as various notions of human rights, um, but they wish to engage in international interchange because they find that beneficial, because it helps to advance the state. A third model here we could think of as popular authoritarianism. And this is one in which the leader claims that they represent national interests and that they don't actually have to hold free and fair elections because if they did, they would be elected anyways because they're sufficiently popular. And this is predominantly a nationalistic vision, uh, which is also typically very heavily statist in the sense that the state is heavily involved in the economy and influences who wins and loses. Uh, if you want to think of the two primary models of this in current world politics, they would be Russia and Venezuela. And the fourth model is the Islamicist, which is here the principle in some sense is the claim that the government exists to embody or for foster the ideal order, which is based on Islam. And this is where ISIS fits in because it's not the only version of the Islamist state out there. The Islamic Republic of Iran is another very different one, but it's a very extreme example of this particular form. Okay, now the thing is these different four visions of the state imply different types of international orders. And they explain why certain issues continue to be contested in world politics today, such as the opposition between human rights versus state sovereignty that we find between those in the West versus that second model, the, the, the high-performing autocracy, and the third model, the popular nationalist. Uh, it's also questions about the openness of the global economy because those first two types of systems are quite happy to have an open, an open global economy, whereas the third and fourth generally are opposed to that. Then what makes ISIS particularly important in this model as a very extreme version of the Islamicist, um, the Islamicist model is it poses a transnational challenge to the order created by the US and the West. Now that seems very far away from us and at the, at the moment it is, but that's in an ideological sense how it fits in the larger picture here. But of course the question is, this is far away, the other side of the world. Does this actually require a response by the United States and the West? And here's where we get into the tough part of foreign policy, which is the practical politics, is that taking actions to enforce those different international norms involves lots of different flows of costs and benefits. And many of the things that you would like to do to advance interests that, that or, or values that, we, that we, pl we place a very, very strong weight on may simply be too costly to engage in. And therefore, foreign policy is involved in the marriage of the practical politics of what you can do in, in the world with advancing the principles that you think are important in, 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 in ordering the world. And so in that sense that although the West may advance a certain vision, that does not mean that you should therefore go out and take all possible actions to advance that, that vision. And in particular, what are the practical considerations involved in any sort of large-scale <coughs> intervention against ISIS? Well, first of these is that there's very little domestic support in the United States for any imposition of a large-scale ground force, again, in the Middle East. That to the extent that there is any support domestically, the Obama administration does not appear to be in, have the slightest interest in trying to rally that opinion and make such a case for that. And I think that's an accurate reflection. And that matters because in a democracy, if you don't have popular support for, that, for those positions in foreign policy, you will not be able to persist in them over long periods of time. Secondly, there are the difficulties of actually intervening in the region, which is the combination of, of course, the Syrian civil war and also the ongoing fighting in Iraq and the difficulties of the Turks, who probably could play the largest role here, and their ambivalence about what side to be involved in. Um, I particularly like this because this is an example that the old adage that the enemy of my enemy is my friend is not true in all cases. All right, so what is to be done? The key thing to realize is that in a fundamental level from the point of view of the West, this is an ideological struggle. The good news is that in the long run, democracies are actually good in winning these contests. If you think back to the Cold War, in some sense, the Western vision defeated the, defeated the communist vision as propounded by the Soviet Union, primarily on an ideological level. And that eventually, those who, who, who lived in the Soviet Union and its satellite states came to believe that the communist system was not good and abandoned it. Now, the, the second part of the good news here is that ISIS's ideology, its extreme version of Islamicism, is likely to prove unpopular to most in the region. So that those who welcome ISIS, as Juan Cole accurately described or earlier this year, they're likely to feel less comfortable about this as the, the reality of what governance by ISIS looks like. Now is the downside of this. 
is that this takes decades, however. And the second hard part of it I didn't put on my slide is this is something that the West can influence only very, very indirectly. That the essential ideological solution to the problem is for Muslims to come to, to figure out for themselves how to reconcile properties of good governance and the like with their religion. And that's not one that the West can tell them how to do it. It's one they have to discover for themselves. All right, so then what is the policy here? Well, the, the other problem with waiting decades for this is that ISIS is in a position that they could do a great deal of damage um, in the short run. And given their acquisition of a substantial amount of <coughs> heavy equipment with the routing of large numbers of Iraqi army units this summer, they've acquired a lot of heavy equipment. So what we have is practically a strategy that says that what we want to do is level the battlefield. That to engage in low cost military intervention that will enable the United States to, to reduce the imbalance in force between the two sides so that local forces can contest ISIS. And that finally brings me to my last point, which is actually where the problem in, US po in, in, in what, the, what the Obama administration has done. It's not the policy. The policy makes a lot of sense in this setting. It's the disconnect between the policy and the rhetoric. Uh, and that, that President Obama would quite correctly, when his, in his address said that, we seek to degrade ISIS, but then went and added the other DE, which was to destroy it. Because the point is, the rhetoric is different from the policy. There's no interest in the United States in pursuing a course of action that would actually destroy ISIS. And uh, the, the danger in the disconnect is I can already see uh, the next release from ISIS in, say, a year, quoting President Obama about how he intended to, how the United States intended to destroy ISIS with a sort of a message of, we're still here. Thank you. to a good answer to all those questions, but we do know from our surveys in the Arab world that uh, support for Islam playing a political role is decreasing pretty substantially and pretty significantly. There's some variation from country to country, uh, but as a, as, a, as a result of what's happened during the Arab Spring and subsequent events, the rise to power of Islamist governments in a number of really key countries, Tunisia and Egypt, uh, popular discontent uh, with those governments, <coughs> fueled perhaps in part by some things that the old regime did, but basically by the poor performance of the governments themselves, uh, and uh, those governments falling from power. And most recently, we had an election in Tunisia where the quote-unquote secularists, that's probably not the best term, uh, won. I think it's, uh, I, I think it's a, a pretty good, uh, it's, pre it's pretty good to infer from this that support for Islamist government and by extension, ISIS would be evaluated on a bunch of different levels, not just in terms of their Islamic ideology and their Islamic uh, assertions. <coughs> but I think it's fair to say that support for what they represent is way down. The one other point I would make is that we, we do know that they've been pretty successful in attracting individuals from some of these countries 
to go to ISIS and join as fighters. Uh, and although this is somewhat anecdotal, uh, we know uh, the classes uh, out of which those people are coming. They're not people with uh, Islamic education or coming out of Islamic movements. They're essentially the, the dispossessed and the unemployed. Uh, so uh, there isn't a lot of evidence that, that the Islamic message and what ISIS represents in that sense uh, is finding uh, broad support. Uh, there is some support for uh, resistance to, uh, especially since uh, the U.S. has started bombing, to the extent that we don't have a good reputation in the area, and people who are seen as resisting us uh, get a certain amount of support just by virtue of that. But in the context of the question that was asked, uh, is this a model or uh, an experience that draws a lot of support on its face, given its mission? Uh, I would say we, we, we're, we're pretty confident in saying the answer to that is no. Can I say that uh, the Arabic press throughout the region views uh, ISIL and uh, uh, so-called Caliph Abu Bakr as crackpots. Uh, I mean, the atmosphere in the region is it's sort of as though you know, the Ku Klux Klan had taken over an American state and the leader, the Grand Wizard, had declared himself the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, I mean, the, this is not, uh, with, with all due respect to, to my colleague, uh, not at all like Iran. Uh, it's, it doesn't have the legitimacy that the Islamic State of Iran has managed to establish for itself. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's viewed as a, as a gang, you know, that happens to have managed to take over some territory in places where the state collapsed. Uh, and um, so uh, even the movements of political Islam in the region, uh, whether it's the Nahda or Renaissance Party in Tunisia, uh, which lo just lost the election in favor of secularists there, uh, or uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, even Hamas and Gaza, they all condemn these guys as a bunch of crazies who are, and, and the, the phrase is used that they're, they're, they're uh, putting Islam in a bad light. The people are actively embarrassed about them. And I, I don't know of any major pre-existing uh, political grouping in the region that approves of them or speaks well of them or is willing to uh, ally with them openly including Al-Qaeda, which has repudiated them. Uh, so they're, they're just viewed as, as wild men, as, as outlaws, uh, and uh, uh, not as having any legitimacy at all in the region. And a poll was done in Syria of how many Syrians thought that ISIL represented them, and it was 2%. You have to worry about the 2%, but it, it's still, it's, it, I think that's typical. Well, I'll add a, a, just a few quick comments on some of these. Um, in terms of how they act inside territories, they, they want to try and act like a state. And therefore, they do things like try to collect taxes, try and generate government revenue, try to carry out justice and the like. And in that sense, they do try and, try and act like a state. Uh, their relations, to the extent we've heard about them with other Syrian rebel groups that are opposed to the Assad regime, are not very pleasant. That in fact, a lot of their, their rise came about from, from wars over control of local areas inside Syria. Um, and so the fourth question about <coughs> resistance to ISIS inside the areas they've, they've occupied, you hear stories about this, but they're stories, and one has no idea how, how widespread these are. And it's, this is not one where one can easily run an opinion poll. There are several questions uh, regarding uh, Turkey and Turkey's role, as well as uh, the role of the Kurds and the impact it's going to have on the Kurds. So I'm going to um, just read a sampling of those questions and hope that, that those of you who ask other questions that are similar get your um, at least a uh, sampling of your uh, question heard. Um, so two on the role of Turkey. First, uh, for all the panelists, what do you think about the role of Turkey in the crisis in Syria and Iraq? How does the sector support the, this fundamentalist group? Um, how do you evaluate Turkey as a role model, democratic sector in the war against ISIS? Can we trust Turkey as a reliable partner? I think um, Professor Moore talked about this a bit uh, in the fight against ISIS. Why can we not? Uh, if we cannot, why can we not uh, rely on Turkey as a reliable partner? And now on the Kurds and the role of the Kurds. Um, 
Um, what are the chances of the Kurds being an independent state as a result of Iraq and Syria's failure? And given the fierce Kurdish resistance to ISIS's advances in northern Iraq and Syria, what are the prospects for an independent Kurdish state? There was also a question to Professor Tesler in particular about um, Kurdish attitudes and why their attitudes were related only to their sectarian identity as opposed to their ethno-national identity. If you could speak a little bit about the sampling of the, the Kurds in the Kurdish areas of Iraq. Would any of you like to speak to any other questions? Uh, you well, I'll say. <laughs> no, I'll say a little bit about Turkey. I, I think part of part of Turkey's perspective is is the United States a reliable ally for them? They have a problem that they 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 live in the neighborhood, and that they have much more at stake than outside powers do, which I think is part of their their diffidence about about being involved. Is they're afraid that basically everyone else will want them to do the heavy lifting. Well, and, and, and we know that a couple of things that are driving Turkish uh, assessments in this uh, and their willingness or unwillingness to ally with us is the priority they attach to uh, opposing the Assad regime in Syria and in particular their worry that uh, strengthened uh, Kurdish forces will end up uh, opposing, uh, uh, will, will, will be a force for more autonomy or even potentially independence uh, for, for Kurds inside. So uh, it's exactly what Juan said. The, the enemy of the friend of my enemy is no, not necessarily um, the enemy of my enemy. Um, yeah, yeah, right. Well, anyway, <laughs> what he said is right. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, uh, are you? Yes. So with regard to Turkey, the thing to remember is that uh, the, the current Justice and <coughs> Development Party of Turkey tried very hard to be friends with Bashar al-Assad. Uh, this is. This is not something, a situation where you can read off from political ideology because the Justice and Development Party, you can't call it an Islamist party. Uh, it's a party which has some Islamists in it, uh, but it's a party that made its way in Turkey by advocating for a kind of multiculturalism. Uh, you know how in, in the American right there's this myth about a war on Christmas and that religious people are somehow marginalized in the United States today and, and so forth. And uh, uh, that, the, 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 that myth actually is true in Turkey, that is, religious people were marginalized in Turkey and there was a, a war on the equivalent of Christmas. Uh, and uh, secularists were in power there and the, the Justice and Development Party was a vehicle for people to reassert themselves who, who were religious, but it didn't have as its goal overturning uh, the traditions of the 20th century Turkish secularism uh, in the main, maybe at the margins. But it wasn't like the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt or, or like the Khomeinists in Iran who wanted you know, Islamic law as interpreted by medieval jurists to be the law of the land and so forth. So they were perfectly happy uh, to cooperate with the, with the secular Ba'ath government in, 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 Turkey, in, in Syria. And indeed, they had big plans for a kind of Turkish economic uh, uh, imperium in the <coughs> Middle East. They, they vastly expa expanded their trade in the, in the Arab world, uh, which was on top of the trade with Europe. So they added about 25% to their trade by reaching out to, to places like Syria. So when the Arab Spring broke out and the Syrian uh, people rose up against the regime, uh, the, the Assad regime decided to deal with this by drawing up tanks and firing tank shells into the middle of civilian peaceful demonstrations and just killing people. Or they put snipers up on, on the roofs of buildings and fired into the middle of the demonstrations. And they would kill like eight per demonstration. It was very clear that they had a kind of quota to try to scare people from coming back out, uh, in which they failed. But a as things ratcheted forward, the fact that the, the Alawite Shiites dominated the upper echelons of the government, and many of the protesters were Sunni Arabs from the center of the country, <coughs> made it increasingly look like a sectarian struggle. And the, the Justice and Development Party represents the Sunni, sort of more committed Sunnis of Turkey. So it was impossible for them to stand with al-Assad in this situation. They would have alienated their own right wing, uh, the Justice and Development Party. And so they decided that Assad had to go. 
Uh, but Assad going is a big problem because he was, the, the Ba'ath regime was a guarantor of stability there. What would happen if the two million Kurds in northeast uh, Syria spin off and become independent? That's a problem for Turkey, which is afraid of its own uh, Kurdish separatists and that the country could get divided by ethnic lines. Uh, what happens if, if, if al-Qaeda takes over uh, 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 Syria and, 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 and the, the, the Justice and Development Party is you know, what our analysts would call moderate Islam, so they're afraid of al-Qaeda and a crackdown on it in Turkey and so forth. So, uh, I think there. I think the analysis is exactly right. Is they don't exactly know what to do about all this. They want Assad to go, and they want people like themselves, uh, kind of secular-minded, open-minded Muslims, to come to power in, in Syria. And they don't know how to make that happen. And as the religious, uh, the, the the rebels have taken on a more and more radical coloration. The, the Turks have kind of held their nose and continued to support the rebels, uh, but I, I think that uh, it's, it's, uh, it's gone in a direction that, that, that really puzzles them what to do about it. And, uh, and, and so the United States has gone to Turkey and said, see here, we expect you to be an ally in this push against ISIL. And the, the Turks have said, yes, we'll, we'll do that, but then uh, there's no follow through, and they're clearly worried still about the Kurds and, uh, and, and, and alienating their own Sunnis and all of these considerations uh, kind of paralyze them. One other point about, um, about Turkey. Um, so as I was saying that uh, there's, there's something of a division uh, in the Middle Eastern Muslim world about whether Islam should or should not play an important role in political life and whether an Islamic political formula is the right political formula. Uh, that's shrinking. Uh, it's shifting toward the people who want Islam out of politics, people who are very devout and for whom religion is very important, but leave it out of politics. But if we ask the people who do want uh, Islam, uh, if who do embrace an Islamist political formula, uh, well, is there a country that kind of represents what you think might be a, a good model? Uh, most will say Turkey. Very few will say Iran, just as a, as a kind of side note. And I wasn't sure about the question about the Kurds uh, that I was asked. Just asking you, um, maybe it's you or the first one yes. asked when you come to you sure. talk to you what I wanted to ask you in more detail about whether the Kurds were referring to um, the sectarianism or their ethno-nationalism, sort of trying to parse out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure we asked the question that way, but it's clear this, the Kurds have, uh, I mean, in terms of where, where they live and in terms of the language they speak, that they've got uh, more of, a, of, a, of an identity on their own. Uh, and even under Saddam, I think that was, that was true to some extent. In terms of the sample, uh, they came up in appropriate proportions in a nationally representative sample. Does anyone have anything to say about the process of an independent Kurdish state that came up a couple of times in the questions? About a, a, a independent Kurdish state in northern Iraq, or, right. yeah. Well, you know, the Kurds in northern Iraq are independent. They're the Taiwan of the Middle East. They're independent in every way that matters. The Iraqi National Army can't set foot in Kurdistan. When you fly to Erbil, they stamp your passport. Kurdistan. There's no mention of Iraq. They're doing oil deals without without going through Baghdad. Uh, they're a state. Uh, they're independent, but it's like Taiwan. If you say that publicly, it causes a war. So we, we can't we can't talk about it. Uh, there's a one Iraq policy, uh, and uh, uh, so the uh, uh, when ISIL took over Mosul, uh, the the and the Iraqi army ran away from the north. Uh, the Kurds inherited uh, Kirkuk which they have wanted for a long time. They have three of the old Iraqi provinces and they went fourth. They now have it, de facto. And uh, Masoud Barzani, the president of Kurdistan, uh, uh, announced that they would have a referendum in six months on independence. He was just going to go for it and use ISIL as the pretext to go for it. But then uh, ISIL made a move on Erbil, and, and the Peshmerga didn't really do very well. We were all surprised because they were supposed to be good fighters. And uh, it was clear that Erbil needed the Americans to come in to save them. And the Americans told them, well, you know, we could save you, but um, we don't like this independence business. That's going to cause trouble for our NATO ally Turkey and uh, uh, for, for, you know, uh, 
uh, unconscionable for Saudi Arabia because minus Kurdistan, Iraq is a very Shiite country. Uh, so we want you not to declare independence. And the Americans have come in and bombed ISIL and pushed them back from Erbil. And all that talk about Kurdistan independence has gone away. So, you know, Iran doesn't want it to be independent. Turkey doesn't want it. The United States doesn't want it. Syria doesn't want it, so on and so on and so forth. It's very hard to do, but they have it de facto anyway. Okay, do I have, do you have a comment? No. I have three questions that are specifically for uh, Professor Khalil. Um, first, how seriously uh, should we consider the objective of establishing a worldwide geo on the part of either ISIS or Al-Qaeda? Um, second, how accurately is Western media reporting the facts of what is occurring within worldwide Muslim communities? I'm not sure anybody can answer that definitively, but you can try. <laughs> um, give me your training. There's one case for you. Third, it may be that Islamic leaders have condemned ISIS, yet why is it that ISIS is such a stronger ongoing voice in social media, be it its propaganda in relation to condemnations by Islamic leaders? So why are they getting more press than those that are condemning them? That's a great question. Um, and finally, if the whole world sees ISIS as terrorists, why do we continue to use the word Islam? Can you say that last question again? If the whole world sees ISIS as terrorists, why do we continue to use the word Islam? Okay. Sure. <laughs> uh, so the worldwide caliphate. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that they will ever succeed. Uh, they don't have enough support, um, and I don't think they have the means to do that. Uh, but certainly, the, you know, just the mere intention, the mere desire to do this, to establish this. Um, we're, we already see what's going on in, in with with ISIS. I mean, it's a cause for concern, obviously. Uh, the media, yeah, they, there are some issues there. Media portrayal of Islam, obviously. Um, the issue of, um, let, me ask, let me answer the last question about ISIS. Why do we refer to it as Islamist? Islamist, you know, this is a term that we use to refer to individuals and groups that think of Islam as a political ideology. Uh, and so they certainly would qualify as Islamist using that understanding, um, that terminology. Uh, but they would, of course, be radical Islamists. Islamist does not mean terrorist, right? Uh, so they would be radical Islamists. And of course, you know, this, this terminology, I mean, you know, I'm not so happy, I'm not so uh, excited about some of these terms that we use, even like the term jihadist. I think that actually encourages people. Uh, maybe harabist would be a more appropriate term, um, where, you know, you, you're saying that they're guilty of haraba, which is, a kind, which is the most severely punishable crime in Islamic law. Uh, as for ISIS's popularity, um, now, perhaps my colleagues will have something to say about this. I, you know, certainly they, actually Professor Tesla already mentioned, you know, that we see people from the West who are attracted to ISIS, who maybe they just converted or they don't have much background in Islam, uh, who are attracted to ISIS because of its message. It's, um, you know, there's something, there's something, there's certainly an attraction there. Uh, but I'll defer to my colleagues to sort of uh, take it from there. Uh, I'll add a quick comment about, you know, <clears throat> the other thing that are to understand about their strategy, because they recruit transnationally, they don't have to be popular with the very many people to right. succeed. You know, there's about one and a half billion Muslims in the world. If they recruit one out of 100,000, that's 15,000 recruits. And so, so in, in one sense, if you think about that as a recruiting strategy, Part of it is is they, they're very happy to lay out a very extreme vision because it, it is in part a recruiting tool for for a certain segment of the people. And it doesn't have to respond or, or be seen as legitimate in the eyes of very many people to be able to sustain that sort of authoritarian power. There's been a, a, a little work. Uh, I'm thinking about attraction from, uh, from Arab countries. And I'm thinking in particular of Tunisia, which is actually Surprisingly, maybe the country that has the largest number of, of foreign fighters uh, uh, in, in in Syria or Iraq with with, with ISIS, uh, and uh, well, while there's a lot more work to be done, uh, it appears. This is sort of what I said before. This, it appears that these people are coming out of uh, the really disadvantaged sector of society where people don't have. Uh, uh, much hope of, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a good future, are looking for uh, something to identify with. Um, there have been some studies in terms of 
uh, how some of them are recruited <coughs> and how people who go there uh, send text messages back and, and try to tell them it's an important cause. So we know something about it, um, and it, it isn't really about Islam. I think that's the, the main point I, I would want to make, and that uh, it's, it's the resistance or it's the promise of a better life, and maybe for some, the idea of dying and having something better in the afterlife. I don't know if that's completely absent, uh, but it's, uh, it's not that they're sending out the, these messages and everybody says, oh, well, that's what Islam is, and she was. Now I know I'm, 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 I'm off. I mean, it's really not about that. Yeah, there's no support for a, a revived caliphate in the, in the Muslim world. The polling on this is very clear. Uh, th there hasn't been actually a caliphate since 1258 when the Mongols took Baghdad. Apparently, it was considered bad luck in, in medieval Islam to uh, shed the blood of a caliph. So the Mongols had this problem of how to kill him. They rolled him up in a Persian carpet and beat him with hammers. Uh, that was the last real caliph. Uh, it didn't end well. Uh, and since then, there have just been empires and states and kings and more recently republics. And Sunni Islam has managed to deal with this. And I would argue that actually what's happened in the last 150 years is that in ways we haven't recognized, uh, Sunni Islam has been Protestantized. Uh, so they don't have strong religious hierarchies in Sunni Islam. Their ulama or clerics are more like Protestant pastors than anything else. And each country organizes the uh, juris consults and, uh, and, and the religion in a way. So there's a mufti of Egypt and a mufti of Syria and so forth. So it's very much like uh, Lutheranism, you know, Swedish Lutheranism and German Lutheranism. And so that's the way Sunni Islam is now organized. It's organized on a national basis. And what ISIL represents <coughs> is, a, is a tiny lunatic fringe that's fighting against this Protestantization of Sunni Islam and saying, no, we should have a United States of Islam and there should be a revived caliphate from the uh, Ottoman period, typically, or the medieval period, and so forth. But it's it's not a widespread aspiration, uh, and, and, and frankly, the, the Ibrahim Samarai, who has a, 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 a two-bit PhD from the University of Baghdad, is not going to be the one that will inspire this vision in any case. So it's, it's, it's really, uh, the whole thing is, is, is nonsensical. The only reason ISIL, uh, we're sitting here talking about it, is the Syrian state collapsed, and then the Iraqi state decided to badly mistreat its Sunnis and shell them from the air and with, with helicopter gunships and drive them into the arms of even the lunatic fringe. Uh, I don't expect them to have any staying power. Uh, I, I think they're very, the main people involved in this movement are likely to be dead within five years. Putin doesn't want them there. Iran doesn't want them there. Syria doesn't want them there. Baghdad doesn't want them there. The United States doesn't want them there. The UK, France. So after a while, they won't be there. <laughs> do you want to ask me one? Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to ask a few more questions. And again, our sampling of uh, lots of questions that are being asked. And then I'm going to allow the panelists to decide whether they want to answer a specific question or just have a summation of their remarks. We've got about uh, seven or eight minutes uh, left. So a number of questions about the role of other countries, not just Turkey, but other countries like Saudi Arabia, um, in the growth and development of ISIS. I don't know if others want to uh, remark on that. Um, specifically, uh, one person wrote, can you talk a little bit more about ISIS's interaction with states in the region? Um, do any of them directly support uh, the actions of ISIS, which are, which, who are its enemies and who are its friends in the region? That's a broad question. Um, and then there are questions about uh, strategies that the U.S. can use other than uh, ground troops or bombers. Is it possible for um, the U.S. to um, uh, limit the funding that ISIS receives? How does ISIS generate so much revenue? Um, what legal political barriers are present to limiting their ability to generate revenue? Um, and then there's, there's a question too about whether or not they limit their ability to recruit through social media and otherwise. Um, but we've touched on that a bit. So are those questions that you want to address specifically, or if you want any sort of general remarks um, in the last few minutes? Uh, I'd just say on the revenue front that the I believe the U.S. government has tried to do some things about this. I mean, there's revenue sources. 
there are some donations. I don't think that's a large part of it. They captured a huge amount of money when they overran parts of northwestern Iraq. Uh, they also have captured oil wells, and they smuggle oil out through other places. Um, and in fact, that's, I believe, one of the main reasons why one of the recent targets of, of U.S. airstrikes were some of those oil wells and, and refineries in an attempt to try and, and reduce that ability to raise money through oil. Yeah, they, um, um, they, the, the wealth of ISIL has been vastly exaggerated by the press, especially compared with <coughs> other such movements. So, uh, well, six or seven years ago uh, during the Iraq War, the New York Times estimated that $5 billion a year was being smuggled in Iraqi petroleum out of refineries in Basra by Shiite militias like the Mahdi Army. These are groups, by the way, which are actively now fighting ISIL in Iraq. Uh, so my guess is that the Shiite militias in Iraq are on the order of 10 times more uh, well-funded than, than ISIL is. Uh, raw petroleum is not useful to anybody. If I brought you a bucket of crude oil, you probably wouldn't give me anything for it. But if I brought you a bucket of gasoline and I sold it to you for Oh, I could let you have it for $1.50 a gallon, say. You'd buy it. That's what ISIL's doing. And the, the way you deprive them of that income is you take away the control of the refineries and, and the trucking routes from them. So Turkey had built 12 small refineries in, uh, in Syria. Uh, I think it was in Al-Raqqa province, which ISIL captured. And so the U.S. has been bombing those. They won't be there after a while. Mm -hmm. And the, the ISIL also has a position near the Beji refinery in Iraq. And I think they're able to capture some of the, the, the gasoline trucks from it. Uh, but you know that denying them the oil, the money from smuggling oil, I think wouldn't be so hard, or at least denying them most of it. But then the other, the, aside from these uh, uh, um, these kinds of sources of, of income, they also appear to get big money from uh, far right wing billionaires in the Gulf, uh, who are you know have made their money in the oil industry and who have a very narrow vision of what society should be, and, and they're not able to assert themselves <coughs> in Kuwait or the UAE in the way that they would like. So they are imagining a dreamland of, of Salafi Syria, and they send the money to ISIL. Uh, and the US Treasury Department now has sanctioned three Kuwaiti businessmen who we think were, were involved in this. But there, there are lots more. And there's a lot of money sloshing around the Gulf. And there are a lot of people with way too much time on their hands. Uh, and and uh, I think the, the Treasury Department is going to have to take more measures in this regard. <coughs> Other than the comments, questions, or maybe uh, just wrap up the final remarks? Uh, That's fine. Is there a question that, from the audience, is there not a down? Is there a Okay. Is there any uh, recommendations for? Improving the situation. Getting out. <laughs> he wants to say about high notes. Right. Yeah. 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 So, no, is there a way out? <laughs> Except to wait. <laughs> well, I, I don't have a good answer to that question. I think it's, it's, it's good that it's asked and that people reflect on it. <clears throat> uh, but I think one of the things that, that needs to happen, that, that maybe we're sort of trying to make happen, uh, is that the uh, the people who are willing to hold, I mean, the, the people who are in the areas controlled by ISIS, who are willing uh, or who feel they have no choice but to hold their nose and make an, make an alliance with them or support them, uh, need to have alternatives. And that means uh, a, a different kind of political configuration and uh, system of government in, in, in Baghdad in which Sunni as well as everybody else can, can find themselves. It's not terribly original because we've been saying that and we're pushing for that. Uh, and there are forces on the other side pushing against uh, Iran, for example. Uh, but I think, uh, um, I mean, there's both the inside and the outside story. I mean, to, to what extent can we, uh, is, this, are there, is there more we can do to uh, uh, 
prevent people from going there, but limit their ability to, to recruit. Uh, yeah, I'm working with some governments to try to do that, but there are going to be limits. Uh, to what extent can we change the political equations in Iraq so people are making different kinds of calculations? That, that's easy to, easier to say than to do, and even to spell out exactly what that would mean uh, is, is, is kind of hard. But I think uh, we know that part of their success uh, has been uh, that uh, some of the territory they've captured, they've had support from the local population, given the things that some of us have talked about, uh, how things look from the point of view of, 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 of Sunnis in the areas where uh, they've come in and uh, successfully uh, chased the Shia army out. The only other thing I would say by way of a concluding comment <coughs> um, is it'd be nice to kind of figure out a way to divorce, and maybe this is not possible, maybe this is a question from my colleague here, uh, but to remove Islam from some of this discussion or to put it in a, uh, in a more restricted kind of context as opposed to coming back, well, is this what Islam is really about? Uh, well, yeah, sort of, but on the other hand, there, there, there are Islamic clerics that condemn it. Uh, in a way, we shouldn't be having that conversation. We should kind of recognize that it's, it's really an aberration by self-appointed people. Uh, you may or may not think they have some legitimate causes given uh, the way the Sunnis have suffered at the hands of the Shia in recent years, which is the opposite of the way the Shia suffered at the hands of, of, of Saddam in an earlier period. Uh, but to kind of keep coming back, and, and we haven't really done this, but it kind of is in the air when people in the U.S. talk about it. Uh, well. Um, so we're getting all these different images of Islam, and maybe they're all sort, of, all sort of legitimate in a certain way, and this is one of the legitimate messages, even though it's not the only one. It'd be nice if we could kind of take that out of the equation. Uh, that's, uh, I could not agree more. Thank you. <laughs> that's good. Thank you.